Praise the Lord. We rise up as we pray together, preparing ourselves for the Bible study tonight. You want to commit yourself to the Lord in prayer. That you come into the Bible study tonight will be of tremendous profit, benefit unto you. That the Lord himself by his spirit will teach you his word. Make you obedient to the word. Grant you the grace, the strength, spiritual strength. That she will be able to stand on the unchanging word of God. That God will help you. And that the Spirit of God will compel you to contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. You'll not be weary, you'll not be tired, you'll not be weak, you'll stand firm on your feet. Spiritually, confronting anything that is erroneous. Standing firm for the truth. With courage and purpose of heart. That you'll declare the truth both by your life. And by the word you declare. To the people that hear you. That the same consecration, the same conviction, the same commitment, the same courage. God gave to Daniel. Before everyone that he had to confront, that same courage, conviction, consecration, commitment, he'll grant unto you. That nothing will ever make you to compromise the truth. And whatever challenge, heat, opposition you may face while standing on the word, you still keep on standing, knowing that God has raised you up at this time for this generation. Like God raised up Daniel for his own generation. Dare to be a Daniel. Dare to be faithful. Dare to stand when and where you ought to stand. Not counting anything small, minute, in the word of God. Knowing that every jot and every tittle, every little bit in the world, demands your loyal, faithful attention. And you'll not be sifting the word of God, rejecting some and saying that's small, that's a non-essential. I can do without that. But God will give you the courage and the firmness to stand on everything in the world that is teaching us that this word of the Lord shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. That thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For only then will you have success and make your way prosperous.
pray that you'll not be among those who are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. This word will mold you, mature you, make you strong, strong in the Lord and in the grace that He provides. In Jesus' name we pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for spreading the table of this spiritual food, the bread of life, before us tonight again. We pray, Lord, you make us hungry enough and thirsty enough that everything you provide will take everything in to build up ourselves spiritually in Jesus' name. Lord, you built up a man like Daniel for his own generation. We pray, Lord, you build up your people for this generation in Jesus' name. Here and all over this city and all over this nation, all over this continent of Africa and beyond. Everywhere we're listening to the word and study together tonight. Oh Lord, I pray that your power will come with the word and energize, empower, equip your people with the word in Jesus' name. This truth of scripture, you make it real in our lives. Make it mighty and powerful in our hearts. And the Lord Jesus has prayed for us already. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. We pray that the sanctifying power in the word will work effectively, effectually in every heart, every life in Jesus' name. As we sanctify us, we strengthen us. So that Lord will be able to stand upon this word and declare this truth without fear, without favor, everywhere you send us in Jesus' name. Make us faithful. Make us loyal, steadfast, and movable in the things of the Lord all the days of our lives. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. We can see now. We come to the Bible study tonight. And how happy I am that you are here. I welcome every one of you in Jesus' name. I pray that your coming every time will make you stronger. And stronger in the things of the Lord in Jesus' name. And when it comes to your own time to stand before Belshazzar's of today. And before the Nicodemus of today. The Lord will give you the same back bone and strength in your spiritual life you will declare the truth without any fear or timidity in jesus name and like paul the apostle you will be able to say that you have not charged to declare the whole counsel of god and what you declare to the people will benefit everyone you speak to in jesus name Tonight we're coming to Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5. We're reading from verse 10. Now the queen by reason of the words of the king and his lords came into the banquet house. And the queen spake and said, O king, live forever. O king, live forever. That's what they always tell them. Actually, Belshazzar was to die that night. And the queen said, O king, live forever. Except you have eternal life, how can you live forever in the presence of God? Thank God for life eternal. O king, live forever. Let not thy thoughts trouble thee. Queen, what are you saying? He ought to be troubled. It's just a few steps to death. His kingdom that night will be divided. And his life will be finished. And he will face the eternal God, the mighty God, on the throne of judgment. And he had not prepared for eternity. Queen, what are you saying? He ought to be troubled. You see all these uh, miserable comforters. You see how they comfort people and say, you live forever when you are about to die. And then they say, let not your thoughts trouble you, nor let thy countenance be changed. Now verse 11, there is a man in thy kingdom, 
in whom is the spirit of the holy gods, and in the days of thy father light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods was found in him. Whom the king Nebuchadnezzar thy father, the king I say thy father, made the master of the magicians and astrologers and the Chaldeans and the soothsayers for as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding and interpreting of dreams and showing of hard sentences and dissolving of doubts were found in the same Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. Isn't it very important and very encouraging that the queen can say without any shadow of doubt that if you call Daniel, there is no doubt about it. He will show the interpretation. When people are so sure of your commitment to the Lord. And when people are so sure of your knowledge in the Lord. When people are so sure of your relationship with the Lord. That even before you get there they say, call brother so and so, call sister so and so. If he comes there, she comes there, he or she will handle this. This is no, no big deal for him. That the people of the world can be certain and sure. That if you get there, problems will melt away. I said, when you get there, problems will melt away. And so she said, he will show the interpretation. Then was Daniel brought in before the king. And the king spake and said unto Daniel, Art thou that Daniel which art of the children of the captivity of Judah, whom the king my father brought out of the jury? I have even heard of thee. That the spirit of the gods is in thee, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom is found in thee. And now the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me, that they should read this writing and make known unto me the interpretation thereof, but they could not show the interpretation of the thing. And I have heard of thee that thou canst make interpretations and dissolve doubts now. If thou canst reach the writing and make known to me the interpretation thereof, thou shalt be clothed with scarlet, and have a chain of gold about thy neck, and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let thy gifts be to thyself, and give thy rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing unto the king, and make known to him the interpretation. That's what we're studying tonight, Belshazzar. And that essential feast that led him to profanity and sacrilege. He told them to bring the instruments or the utensils or the vessels of the house of the Lord, that she will drink wine out of them and praise the gods of gold and silver and stone and iron and wood. At the peak of that feast and fleshly indulgence, he saw the hand of the invisible judge writing his final condemnation on the wall. The king, this is Belshazzar, his lords and his princes, his wives and his concubines that were there in that sensual feast, all of them, they were seized with a fearful consternation. Fear came upon them. And terror came upon them, and they trembled and shook, and, and they could, did not know what to do. Even though he did not understand the writing, even though the interpretation had not come yet, it struck terror and fear into him. In that hour of frightening crisis, a trustworthy interpreter of the handwriting on the wall was needed. All the wise men of Babylon could not read or interpret the divine sentence on the wall. Then the queen remembered Daniel and recommended him to be brought in to read the, and interpret the writing. Daniel was divinely commissioned man 
It was the demanding commissioned man for every hour of crisis in Babylon. Have you seen from chapter 1 to chapter 2, chapter 4, chapter 5 now. Every time a crisis arose and they didn't find anybody to solve the problem. He was the man. A called man, a commissioned man, a consecrated man, a man, an uncompromising man, a person that had the spirit of God upon his heart, upon his life, and he always had the revelation knowledge that will provide solution to the problem. There has always been a search for a man in the hour of crisis, and the search for a man is still on today. The Lord is still seeking, is still searching. In your community, in your country, in our continent, anywhere you are, there is enough problem there and people are searching for somebody that has the spirit of God and the power of God and the commitment to be a solution, not just provide a solution, to be a solution to the problems of their lives. I pray you'll be the man. I said you will be the man. If you look at Ezekiel chapter 22, Ezekiel chapter 22, you'll see in verse 30, Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30, and I sought for a man, and I sought for a man, it says in that passage, among them that should make up the edge. And stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. Do you remember the time of Abraham? That he is in the hour of Lord's crisis in Sodom. God found a man, Abraham. And I sought for a man. In the hour of Egypt's looming food crisis, God found a man. His name, Joseph. And I sought for a man. Not only that, in the hour of Israel crisis in Egypt, and later in the wilderness, God sought for a man that would take the people out of captivity and take them to the land of freedom, the land of promise. And God found a man, Moses. In the hour of national crisis, when the might of the Philistines would have swallowed up the nation of Israel, God found a man, his name David, in the hour of spiritual crisis, during the reign of Ahab, God found a man, Elijah, in the hour of religious confusion and crisis in God's chosen nation, God found a man, his name John the Baptist, in the hour of deadly damning spiritual crisis in the Gentile world. God found a man, his name Paul, Paul the Apostle. We need such a man today. And you can be that man. I say you can be that woman too. It says in this place, and I sought for a man among them that should make up the edge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it in the time of Ezekiel. God had to say, and but I found none. In our own time, he'll find you. And you'll come up. You might be like an Esther, a Deborah, that will rise up, and then you'll save multitudes of people. You might be like a John the Baptist. That will proclaim the words of the Lord and turn the minds and the hearts of people and turn them to the Lord. God has found you today. He will anoint you with the Spirit, empower you, energize you, and then make you ready. And then when you come, the word of God will not fail in your mouth. We're looking at this study tonight under three subtitles. Number one, the selection of a divinely commissioned man the selection of a divinely commissioned man number two the summons of a decidedly consecrated messenger summons of a decidedly consecrated messenger number three the spirituality of a doctrinally committed minister we're coming to number one the selection of a divinely commissioned man. We're looking at Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5. What did he once again from verse 10? Let me go to verse 11. There is a man in thy kingdom. Just that. 
There is a man in thy kingdom. And then he mentioned the name Daniel. And what a man Daniel was. In Belshazzar's hour of crisis, there was a desperate search for a man who could read the unreadable. Think about that. To read the unreadable. And to be able to interpret the mysteries and make mysteries meaningful. Such a man who would reveal God's mind to the materialistic monarch must be peculiar, he must be pure, and he must be spiritually prepared. What qualified Daniel for such a ministry that no other man was suitable for? I want you to look at that verse 11. There is a man in thy kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. I want you to understand the language of the queen. She was a Babylonian, a Chaldean. And therefore she didn't understand the language of the Jewish people. She didn't understand the, the, qualific- the, the, the name, the title of the God of heaven. All she could say is, this is not like the defiled gods of the land, the dead gods of the land. This is the living God, the, the holy God. And then he says, this man Daniel has the spirit of the holy gods. If you were to translate that into the language of the real Bible believer, all it means is he has the spirit of the God who is holy. Or he has the Holy Spirit who also is God. What then? What kind of man then? Will God be looking for today? People who are filled with the Spirit of God. Can I just show you in the Word of God that at any time when God needs people, at any time when God is searching for people, people that will do something peculiar, something special, something unique, something that other people have failed to do, He will not just be looking for people that have Normal knowledge, scientific knowledge, sense knowledge, empirical thing that you touch, you taste, you, you kind of experiment. It's, you'll be looking for people that have the spirit of God in them. The people that have the Holy Ghost in feeling them indwelling them, saturating them, filling them up, and the people that are moved and controlled and directed by the Spirit of God. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 13. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13, 16, 13, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. That's the secret. That's the secret. If you're going to be the peculiar person that will be used in a unique way, in a special way, in a peculiar way in this generation, saved sanctified, saturated, and filled with the Spirit of God. And let's look at this now. Uh, uh, David knew that the importance of that, of keeping that, and doing for power, in feeling of the Holy Spirit, anointing by the Holy Spirit, he knew the importance of that. And so he said in Psalm 51, in Psalm 51, I'm reading from verse 11. Psalm 51, verse 11, cast me not away. From thy presence, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. He knew that if you are going to serve the Lord in any successful way, profitable way in the nation, anywhere, you must retain that power, that anointing, that unction of the Spirit of God. He says, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Then he says in verse 13, then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Micah chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 8. Micah chapter 3 and we're reading from verse 8 the importance of having the spirit of God that coin said Belshazzar you're looking for somebody special somebody unique somebody different 
Somebody who can do what all these others were not able to do. We have Daniel. And he has the spirit of the Holy God in him. That is what qualifies us today. Having the spirit of God. You are saved. Then you are sanctified. And then you are baptized and filled to overflowing with the spirit of God. Micah chapter 3 verse 8. But truly I am full of power by the spirit of the Lord. And of judgment and of might to declare unto Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. We're looking at Luke chapter 1. The nation of Israel had backslidden and had been complete silence. No connection between earth and heaven for 400 years. No prophet ever rose up. In those times of period, we call intertestament period. 400 years. Everything was dark and deadly. And now God was raised up a man that would turn everything around and bring revival. The forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ. What was the one qualification that he needed? The Spirit of God being upon him. We're looking at Luke chapter 1. In Luke chapter 1 verse 15. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord. And shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled, filled with what? With the Holy Ghost. That's very important. In verse 16, and many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and in the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. You see the importance of being filled with the spirit of God. If you are going to be able to have any relevance in the ministry today, in the ministry of preaching the word and showing people the way of the Lord, we must have the Holy Ghost within us, energizing us, empowering us, equipping us, turning us up and filling us, coming upon us, controlling us, directing us, and revealing to us what people that do not have the Holy Spirit, what they do not know. We need that power. We need that unction. We need that revelation of the Holy Spirit. We're told in John chapter 16. John chapter 16. And we're looking at you from verse 7. Now the Holy Spirit here is called the Comforter. Nevertheless, I, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter, that's the Holy Ghost, will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin. Who will stand before Belshazzar and reprove Belshazzar? And say, Thou King Belshazzar, even though you knew what happened to your father Nebuchadnezzar, you have not humbled yourself before the Lord, and God in whom is your, is your life and your bread, you have not glorified, and you have taken all these vessels from the house of the Lord, and you have drunk wine with your princes and your captains and, and your concubines and your wives. Then, because of that, is this and coming from heaven, writing your condemnation on the world. Who could tell the Shasta that but somebody that has the Spirit of God in the age in which we live today at the time in which we are living today. There are many people that claim to have the Holy Spirit but they do not have the conviction, the courage to be able to challenge the men and the women, the sinners and the backsliders of today about their sin. But you see when you are filled with the Spirit of God it says in verse 8 and when he is come he will reprove the world of sin and then it says of righteousness and of judgment I want you to look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 2 Acts chapter 2 this is what we need the experience of the Holy Ghost baptism upon sanctified cleansed purified vessels only then shall we be able to face the challenge of today and be able to declare unto this generation 
that this is what the Lord requires. I'm reading from Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them clothing tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And then they were all filled with the Holy Holy Ghost and began to speak with all the tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. But that's not the end. That's not the end. Yes, they spoke in tongues. But look at verse 22. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you as you yourselves also know him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain Peter how did you have the courage and the boldness to tell those people this was the one that was just trembling and shaking when he met said thou art one of those disciples and he said i don't know what you're talking about but now the holy ghost came upon him and he said you are taking christ and by wicked hands you know what he meant by wicked hands all those leaders officers of the jewish people he said they're wicked he could say that what happened when he said that verse 30 is verse 37 now when they had this they were preached in their heart and said unto peter and to the rest of the apostles men and brethren what shall we do then peter said unto them repent you see that's why we need the power of the holy ghost i pray that power will come upon you let, let's come back to Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5. A man of the hour. A man for a special ministry. A man of a particular, peculiar, unique, special purpose. And if we're going to be that man today, that's exactly what we need. And then you see what he had, along with that spirit of God that he had. Verse 11. There is a man in thy kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods and in the days of thy father light and understanding and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods was found in him whom the king Nebuchadnezzar thy father the king I say thy father made master of the magicians and the soldiers the Chaldeans and the soothsayers for as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding and interpreting of dreams and showing of hard sentences and the solving of doubts were found in the same Daniel. Now you see the reason why they called him because of those things that he had. And in the days of Pharaoh, God had a man like that too. Let's look at Genesis chapter 41. Genesis chapter 41 and see that when God called people to such special assignment, here is what they had the Spirit of God. We're looking at Genesis chapter 41, I'm reading from verse 38, verse 38. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? They searched in all the land, and nobody could interpret the dream of Pharaoh. Eventually they brought Joseph. A saved man, sanctified, purified man, and a man that had the spirit of God beyond just being pure, which is good, being pardoned, which is good, having good relationship, reconciliation with God, which is good. He also had beyond that, he had the spirit of God in him, and it was recognized even by Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said, can we find such a one as this, a man in whom the spirit of God is? And Pharaoh said in the starting out to Joseph, For as much as God has showed thee all this, there is none so discreet, 
so wise as thou art, thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy words shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over the land of Egypt. Why? Because he had the Spirit of God in him. We're looking at Deuteronomy chapter 34. Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 9. And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom. God needed somebody to replace Moses so that this man would lead the children of Israel into the land of promise. And he needed not just somebody that has experience. Scientific knowledge, administrative knowledge. You need administrative knowledge to be able to guide all these millions of people and lead them into the land of promise. And not just somebody that knows how to solve conflicts, conflict resolution. But you know that there was always conflict in the, in the children of Israel, among the children of Israel. But you need more than that. We need somebody that is filled with the Spirit of God. And so it says in that verse 9, Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the Spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him, as they did, as did, and did as the Lord commanded Moses. And there arose not a prophet since in Israel. Like unto Moses. What's that saying? They were saying, actually, thank God for Joshua. But Moses is irreplaceable. Irreplaceable. They said, well, thank God, Moses laid hands on Joshua. And he was filled with the Spirit of God. And now, he is the one to take the children of Israel into the land. But, even though we say that... This Moses, he was so full of the Spirit of God, he was irreplaceable. You couldn't stand in his shoes because it says, And there arose not a prophet since in Israel, like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face in all the signs and the wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all the servants and to all his land and in all that mighty hand and in all the great terror which Moses showed in the sight of Israel. As you come to the New Testament, the New Testament understood the importance of having the Spirit of God. When they were going to elect anybody, appoint anybody, when they were going to commission anyone to the work of the Lord, even the minutest work in the church in the New Testament, you couldn't take part in that if you were not saved and sanctified. And filled, baptized in the Holy Ghost. Well, uh, they didn't trade talent and skill and human ability, educational qualification, certificates above the spirit. They knew the most important thing to have will be the infilling, the indwelling, and the possession of the Holy Ghost within you. Look at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 6. Acts, chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 3. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you, seven men of honest report. They must be saved. They must be sanctified and have a holy life, an honest life, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. That's just the business of working in their kitchen, of distributing their food, of giving the food. They bought the food and then they distribute to people. They said, before you can even carry a bowl of food in the early church and distribute to the needy in the church of God, you must be full of the Holy Ghost. Think about that. How much more if you are going to lead us fellowship? How much more if you are going to preach? 
How much more? If you're going to be a pastor, you're going to be a leader, you're going to be an overseer over the people of God in the early church. If you are not saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost, you'll never come near touching anything in the work of the kingdom. In verse 3, again, wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you, seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and the chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and of what? And of the Holy Ghost, of the Holy Ghost. Look at verse 8. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. That's the way it happened then. I pray it will happen to every one of us. I said it will happen to you. Now, as we look at Daniel, before we go to the next point, you know, they needed more than men of scientific knowledge and understanding. They needed more than men of wealth and materialistic possession. They needed more than men of worldly wisdom and political methods. You see, all those methods, those things are good for the world. But, there are people who are good for leadership in the world who will never, never come near leadership in the church because we need to be saved and sanctified and filled of the Holy Ghost if you are going to be in any leadership position in the church of the living God where men of earthly influence and intelligence fail. Men like Daniel will have a ministry. And what kind of man was Daniel? Number one, he was a man of uncompromising principle. That man was a principled man. A man of uncompromising principle. Number two, that Daniel was a man of unceasing prayer. Unceasing prayer. Have you noticed what the Bible says about prayer? Pray without ceasing. It doesn't say preach without ceasing. It doesn't say sing without ceasing. It doesn't say laugh, rejoice without ceasing. It doesn't say do this or do that without, but there's one thing. It says you do without season. Pray without season. That Daniel, he was a man of unceasing prayer. Number three, he was a man of untarnished purity. A kind of purity that nothing in Babylon could defile. Number four, he was a man of unmistakable perception. He saw the thing, he deciphered it, he interpreted it, a man of unmistakable perception. Number five, it was a man of unquestionable prudence. Unquestionable prudence. Have you noticed in this case what happened? There was consternation and confusion and crying aloud. And he could hear that. He knew what was going on, but he never showed up until they called him. He wasn't volunteering his gift or any until they called him. He was a man of unquestionable wisdom, prudence. Number five, he was, number six, he was a man of unprecedented prophecy. And if you look at the book of Daniel, you'll see from chapter 2 and chapter 4 and chapter 7, all through to chapter 12, you'll see the prophecy, unprecedented prophecy. Number seven, a man of uncommon perseverance no matter what happened he'll just stay there throw him in the lion's den he can sleep overnight there persecution problem pressure opposition jealousy of those people the envy of those never moved him just a man of Unprecedented prophecy and uncommon perseverance. Number eight, a man of unearthly purpose. His own purpose and goal and drive or something beyond this earth. Number nine, a man of unalterable, unalterable persuasion. He once was persuaded that days are the way to go. An edict of Darius, an edict of Nebuchadnezzar could not change that man. Number ten, a man of unusual power. 
unusual power. And then number 11, a man of unfailing protection. The Lord protected him in the lion's den. Number 12, a man of unconquerable personality. You couldn't conquer that man or crush that man. He was more than a conqueror. And this is what God wants to reproduce in your life. And the Lord will do it. And tomorrow or next week or next month, next year when I see you and I see you standing. And then I see all these qualities. I say, praise the Lord. The study of the word is bearing fruit in your life. You will stand. And nobody will be able to push you down and trample over you in Jesus' name. What a man Daniel was and what a ministry he had. Angels in heaven recognized him. And people on earth remembered him in the hour of crisis. We're coming to point number two now. The summons of a decidedly consecrated messenger. The summons. That means they called him, they brought him in. We're looking at Daniel. Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5. In Daniel chapter 5, we're reading from verse 13. Daniel chapter 5, verse 13. Then was Daniel brought in before the king. Then was Daniel, this man we're talking about, filled with the Spirit of God. Having great wisdom. Then was this Daniel brought him before the king. And the king spake and said unto Daniel, listen to this. At thou that Daniel, which art of the children of captivity, the captivity of Judah, whom the king my father brought out of, Ju- of Jewry, let, let me talk about that for some time. You know, he despised him. Look at a man in problem, despising the man that has the spirit of God. Look at a patient about to die, despising the doctor who could help him. Look at a man that needs to travel to eternity unprepared and is despising the pilot that is going to show him the way to get there. Look at the man that is under judgment. Having a writing on the wall. The writing that says, you are finished. Your kingdom is gone and divided. And tonight, God is through with you. And then he's talking to Daniel, this messenger of God, Daniel, that even heaven recognized and remembered. And he said, are you that Daniel? I've heard of you, of the captivity. I am free. That's what he thought. I am free, but you are a captive. I've heard of you coming here. And then let's see whether you can read this. That's how the people of the world are. This Daniel, let me just show you in Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 11. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee. And stand upright, for unto thee am I sent. And when he had, when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thy heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. That's an angel talking to him. And the angel called him a man greatly beloved. And that's the person, Belshazzar was saying, I doubt that Daniel, a captive from the captivity of Judah. Look at verse 19. In verse 19, and said, it's an angel talking talking, O man greatly beloved, fear not, peace be unto thee, be strong, yea, be strong. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened, and I said, let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. A man beloved of God from heaven, and that's the one this man was despising. Look at Ezekiel chapter 14, Ezekiel chapter 14, and see how Ezekiel a prophet rated and exalted this Daniel in um, Ezekiel chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 12. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, when the land sinneth against me by trespassing grievously, then will I stretch out mine hand upon each. 
and will break the staff of the bread thereof, and will send famine upon it, and will cut off man and beast from it, though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in each. They should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, says the Lord God. And see the way that Daniel was rated. And see where the, the special class, where God put Daniel. He said, when I punish the whole land with famine, there are only three people I can look at. Two of them are gone. Only one is alive in the whole world. Noah, he is gone. Job, he is gone. The third person still alive that I can put in a special class like that, that's Daniel. And that's the one Belshazzar was saying, I doubt that Daniel of the children of captivity. That man was totally ignorant. I pray you'll not be ignorant like that. But you know, you know the other side of the story. You know, sometimes you're a child of God. You're a sage. And then people of the world, they, they, don't, they don't know who you are. That's the way they all talk. They don't worry about that. Are you that so-and-so? The polite member? Hmm, I've heard of you. Those holy, holy people. And then they look down at you like this. And then you're almost looking. Down. Don't look down. Look up. I said, look up. Because they don't know you, they are ignorant. They are the people of the world. Although they despise you, you are the one that has the word of authority. In fact, even their future by prophecies in your hand. And we are going to judge the angels. That's why we don't care what they say. In fact, look at the way they dealt with Jesus Christ. They despised him too. Look at Psalm 22. I'm reading from verse 6. Psalm 22. And we're looking at verse 6, Psalm 22, verse 6. But I am a warm and no man in reproach of men and despised of the people. All they that see me lap me to scorn. They shoot out the leaf. They shake the head saying, he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him seeing he trusts, he delighted in the Lord, in him. If you look at verse 16, verse 16. For dogs have come past me and the assembly of wicked men, of the wicked, have enclosed me. They pierced my hand and my feet. That makes you to know that they are talking about Jesus. Now verse 27, all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn unto the Lord. And, the, and all the kindreds of the kingdom shall worship before thee. You know, the one they are despising, he'll be the king of kings and the lord of lords. The people of the world, they despised him. They made nothing of him. And yet, and yet, he will be the one that will rule over this whole earth. Isaiah chapter 53, I'm reading from verse, 50, from verse 3. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 3. So, when they do it to you, don't worry. Don't, 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 don't care for that. Looking on you. Belittling you. Despising you. Calling your names a child of the children of the captivity. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 53, verse 3. He is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows. And acquainted with grief. And with deed as it were, uh, we hid our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. That's Christ. But that will not continue forever. Look at verse 11. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. You see, the people of the world, they look in the wrong direction. When he saw Daniel, he belittled him. He looked down on him and then he despised him. But heaven exalted that man. The same thing with Christ. Despised and rejected of many man of sorrows. And yet it says, He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. For he shall bear their iniquities. Let me come to Proverbs chapter 12, verse 9. Proverbs chapter 12. We're looking at verse 9. He that is despised and has a servant is better than he that honoreth himself and lacketh bread. He that is despised 
and has a servant. Although you are despising him, but he has something you don't have. Belshazzar, you are despising Daniel, but he has something you don't have. And he that is despised, having a servant, is better, much, much better than he that honoreth himself and lacketh bread. We can say it this way. He that has the Holy Ghost and is despised is better than him that lacks the bread of life. Lacks the water of life. Lacks life eternal. This man, Daniel, and the Holy Ghost, the spirit of the Holy God in him. You can despise him, you can belittle him, you can look down him, but he's better, much better than the people that honor themselves and then they have no bread of life. Say this way. He that is despised and has grace and peace is despised, but he has the grace of God. He has peace in his soul. Is better, much better than he that honoreth himself and lacks divine favor. Look at Belshazzar. He didn't have any favor with heaven, any favor with God. And is despising somebody that has the grace of God and the peace of God. Number three, he that is despised, but he has the hope of heaven. The hope of heaven. And Daniel knew. If Daniel died that day, where will Daniel go? Heaven. Hope of heaven. He that is despised, but he has the hope of heaven, is better than he that honoreth himself and lacks salvation. You know, the man did not have salvation, did not even know what they call salvation, and is despising somebody that has the grace and the peace of God. What did Daniel have? He had prophetic gifts, and no mystery ever bothered or confused him. And he that is despised and has prophetic gifts is much better than he that honoreth himself and he lacks essential revelation of life and eternity. Belshazzar large essential revelation for life and for eternity and he was despising somebody that had revelation knowledge prophetic gifts he that is despised and he has power with God and power with man is better than he that honoreth himself and lacks heaven's approval he didn't have any approval from heaven and he was despising somebody having power with God and power with man. And therefore, when the people of the world, when they belittle you and they despise you and they say, are you that one I heard about? They don't, don't even listen to them because you have something they don't have. We have something, the people of the world, that they don't have. And you know, Daniel was continuing to live and Belshazzar died that night when a dying man that's almost in the grave, almost going to enter into hell, is despising you. How does that bother you? He that is despised and has supernatural protection. Belshazzar, can you follow Daniel to the, to the lion's den? No, I cannot. Don't despise him then. That man is something, somebody special. He that is despised. And as supernatural protection is much better than he that honoreth himself and lacks angelic defense. Daniel had the bodyguard of angels. Belshazzar, you made the greatest mistake of your life to despise him. He that is despised and he has the divine presence and partnership. God walking with him and God moving along with him. This man that Belshazzar was despising, he that is despised and has divine presence and partnership is much better than he that honoreth himself and has a large peace with God. I'd rather be like Daniel. I said I'll be like Daniel. 
I want you to look at First John, First John chapter three, First John chapter three. I'm reading from verse one. First John chapter three, verse one. Behold, behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we shall be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not. Because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. You'll be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Let's come back to Daniel. Daniel chapter 5. In Daniel chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 14 now. Daniel chapter 5, verse 14. I've even heard of thee, that the spirit of the gods is in thee, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom is found in thee. And now, the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me. And then it says that they should read the writing and make known unto me the interpretation thereof, but they could not show the interpretation of the scene. And I have heard of thee that thou canst make interpretations and dissolve doubts. Now, if thou can, if thou canst reach the writing and make known to me the interpretation thereof, thou shalt be clothed or scarlet and have a chain of gold about thy neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Now, when he was brought in, that's how he came in before. If you look at Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 2 from verse 25. Then Ariel brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said thus unto him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah. That's what they always say, but don't mind, don't mind their language. That will make known unto the king the interpretation. And the king answered and said unto Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen, and the interpretation thereof? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king has demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king, but there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets. There is a God in heaven that reveals secrets. You know, Daniel was brought in. He's, he's used to it now. Anytime there was conflict or confusion, they bring him in and he goes in with the assurance that God was with him and the Spirit of God was within him and will always solve the problem and dissolve the doubts and then interpret those hard sentences. Look at Daniel chapter 4, verse 8. Daniel chapter 4, verse 8. But at the last, Daniel came in before me, whose name was Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, and in whom the spirit of the holy God. And before him, I told the dream, saying, O Belteshazzar, master of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy God is in thee. No secret troubleth thee. No secret, no mystery troubleth thee. Tell me the vision of my dream that I have seen and the interpretation thereof. The next time if they bring you to situations like that, you will solve the problem. In First Kings chapter 22, First Kings chapter 22, bringing them in. The special men, the unique men, and the people that are able to say and to preach and to reveal and to interpret what other people are not able to say and not able to preach, not able to interpret and not able to reveal. In First Kings chapter 22, I'm reading from verse 9. First Kings chapter 22, verse 9. Then the king of Israel called an officer and said, he seen hither Micaiah, the son of Imla. Eventually they brought him in. And when they brought him in, he told them the truth. He said in verse 14, Micaiah said, As the Lord liveth, what the Lord has said unto me, that I will speak. 
That's what you ought to do when they bring you in. You'll be faithful to the word of God in Jesus' name. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 38. Jeremiah chapter 38. And we're reading from verse 14. Jeremiah chapter 38 verse 14. Then Zedekiah the king sent and took Jeremiah the prophet unto him into the third entry, that is, in the house of the Lord. And the king said unto Jeremiah, I will ask thee a sin, hide nothing from me. They brought him in, and then he had to tell him what the Lord had said. In verse 17, then said Jeremiah unto Zedekiah, Thus says the Lord, the God of the host, the God of hosts, and the God of Israel, if thou wilt assuredly go forth unto the king of Babylon's uh, princes, then thy soul shall live, and this city shall not be burnt with fire, and thou shalt live and thine house. In its extremity, and its, in its necessity, the king Belshazzar called and sent for Daniel. The wise men of Babylon had disappointed the king in their whole crisis, and in the day of his calamity, their demon intelligence had failed, and he needed a true man of God with superior prophetic gifts and power. Having discovered that worldly wise men and so sayers have no benefit in the day of wrath, he now sought the truth from the true prophet of God. He had trusted in lying wonders for too long. Now he sought the truth. When the truth could, no, could do no good to him anymore in his doomed life. He trembled at the judgment of God, but his obstinate heart found no place of repentance. He promised Daniel some position of honor, but his kingdom and life were to end abruptly that night. Suddenly he died, suddenly he perished, his promises and prosperity, everything became of no value. And let's see now as Daniel came in, and let's see what he said, and let's see how he responded to the king. We're looking at Daniel chapter 5, point number 3, the spirituality of a doctrinally committed minister. This man was spiritual, like you are going to be spiritual. I said like you are going to be spiritual. In Daniel chapter 5 verse 16. And I have heard of thee. That thou canst make interpretations and dissolve doubts. Now if thou canst read the writing. And make known to me the interpretation thereof. Thou shalt be clothed with scarlet. And have a chain of gold about thy neck, and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered and said unto the king, Can you tell me what he said? Let thy gifts be to thyself, and do what? Give thy rewards to another, and yet what? And yet I will read the writing to the king. He said, I don't need any gift. My ministry is not for sale. That's what he was saying. My gifts are not for sale. That's what he's saying. Daniel was a divinely commissioned prophet. That's why he rejected the gift of the profane. I do not trust king. His ministry was not for sale. Neither the man nor his conscience could be bought or bribed with gifts. Belshazzar was a desperate, hardened sinner against the light. And Daniel would not allow gifts or rewards to make him deny or distort the truth. His message to the king was clear and uncompromising. Judgment was to come swiftly. The king and his kingdom were to be destroyed that night. Even the promised gifts and rewards will be of no value. They will be worthless and useless. Now when somebody said, I'm going to make you number three in the kingdom. When number one is gone, is destroyed. Number two is destroyed. Another king, another emperor comes to take over. That third position is useless. And the scarlet that they put on him and whatever it is he wanted to give him, it was useless. 
That's why we should not depend upon what the people of the world, what they are promising, gives from men. Do not capture the interest of God's commissioned ministers because we have rewards from God which will endure until eternity. In fact, the Lord has told us what our attitude ought to be to the gifts that men are proposing that they want to give. I'll give you this if you give me, if you tell me this. I'll do this if you, if you kind of honor my summons and my invitation. You come. But we don't need all those things. Do you need them? From Belshazzar of all people. No, we don't need them. We're looking at Exodus chapter 23. Exodus chapter 23. Verse 8. And thou shalt take no gift, for the gift blindeth the wise, and perverted the words of the righteous. Will not take their gifts from them, because those gifts, they destroy consciences of people. In fact, if you're going to be a real minister, a real leader, a real preacher, a real pastor, a real overseer, a real worker in the kingdom of God... There's a particular qualification you ought to have, and it's revealed in Exodus chapter 18, verses 20 and 21. Exodus chapter 18, verses 20 and 21. And thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws, and shalt show them the way wherein they must walk, and the walk that they must do. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people, able men, this is the qualification of those who are going to serve the Lord, able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating what? Hating covetousness. A pastor will not look at members of his congregation and say, ah, that member has this kind of car. He must also have that kind of car. And this member has this kind of house. He must also have that kind of house. And must be begging people, can you give me this and give me this and give me this? It's going to blind you to standing for the truth. That's why it's saying that if we're going to qualify for real service in the house of the Lord, we must hate covetousness. Deuteronomy chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 18. Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 18. Judges and officers, shalt thou make in all thy gates, which the Lord thy God giveth thee throughout thy tribes, and they shall judge the people with just judgment. Thou shalt not rest twist, distort judgment. Thou shalt not respect persons, neither shalt thou take a gift. Neither take a gift. For a gift doth blind the eyes of the wise, and pervert the words of the righteous. We're looking at Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 7. Surely, oppression maketh a wise man mad, and a gift destroys the heart. The gift will destroy the heart. You'll be like a man of no conviction. You'll be leaning towards where the rich people who are giving you this or that, where they want you to lean. That's why when the Lord sent out his own disciples, he told them what their attitude should be to all these rewards and promises and gifts and this and that. In Matthew chapter 10, Matthew chapter 10, and we're reading from verse 8. Heal the sick. If you are sick, the Lord will heal you. Cleanse the lepers. No skin disease upon your life. Raise the dead. Cast out devils. Tell me the rest. I said you should tell me the rest. Now say it with confidence. Freely ye have received. The gift, the salvation, we receive freely. The sanctification, we got it freely. The baptism, indwelling, in feeling, saturation, immersion in the Holy Ghost, we got it freely. And the power and the gifts of the Spirit, we got it freely. And then the 
power to proclaim the word also we got freely and the lord jesus said freely ye have received and freely give i pray god will give us the grace to do that in jesus name you know temptation will come somebody will offer you something and say give me this and then i'll pay for it you'll overcome that temptation acts of the apostles chapter 8 acts chapter 8 we're reading from verse 18 acts 8 we're reading from verse 18 acts 8 verse 18 and when simon saw that through the laying on of the hands of the apostles uh, of the apostles signs the holy ghost was given he offered them money saying Give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. Did Peter get the money from him? No. Verse 20, but Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. Well, follow these wonderful examples will not sell the gift of God. A gift is a gift. Healing. The gift of healing. Miracle. The gift of working of miracles. And all those wonders. Signs and wonders. is a gift. And if God has given you the Holy Ghost and your ministry to other people, we don't sell gifts. We don't take bribe to give gifts. We give out the gifts freely. Freely ye have received and freely give. And then your reward will come from heaven. In Genesis chapter 14. Genesis chapter 14. Let's see the attitude of Abraham. And the response of Abraham. And then the attitude and the response of those who are walking in the faith of Abraham. In Genesis chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 21. And the king of Sodom. The king of where? The king of Sodom said unto Abraham. Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. And Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from his, from his thread, even to his shoe lashes, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abraham rich. But you know if you go to verse 18. And Melchizedek king of Salem. Brought forth bread and wine. And he was the priest of the most high God. And he blessed him. And said blessed be Abraham. Of the most high God. Possessor of heaven and earth. Your father possesses the heaven and the earth. And then the king of Salem, the prince of peace, has blessed you already. Do you need the blessing of the king of Sodom? No. Because we are blessed by the king of Salem, we refuse the blessing of the king of Sodom. Today the Lord has revealed a lot to us. And the reason why he has revealed to us is that he wants to make you that special man, that special woman, that unique man, and that unique woman, that peculiar man, that peculiar woman. And the Spirit of God will fall mightily upon you. And when there are problems in your community, your country, your continent, you will be the man, you will be the woman of the hour. And God will use you mightily. Why don't you stand up and receive that upon your life? And say today, Daniel is no more here, but you are here. Daniel is no more alive, but you are alive. And you are the one for this hour, for this generation. And the word of the Lord will be mighty in your mouth. And the power of the Lord will be channeled through you to the people around you. Let's pray and talk to the Lord in prayer. Say, oh Lord, thank you for this study today. And thank you because you put me here for this hour, for this time. You will use me. Yes, I will use you. You are the man of the hour. You are the woman of the hour. Daniel served the people in this own generation. You are the one to serve in this generation. 
You are saved. Thank God. Praise the name of the Lord. You are sanctified. Praise the name of the Lord. Sanctification is not by struggling. It's through the cleansing and the washing of the blood of Jesus Christ. It's by grace. The same way you are saved, you receive that sanctification by grace. By faith. By grace through faith. Your faith stretching out your hand of expectation before the Lord. Thank God I'm saved. Thank God I'm sanctified. And that's the same way you receive the Holy Ghost in feeling, in dwelling, baptism, saturation. It's a gift. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Then you'll be the man of the hour. Then you'll be the woman of the hour. And when something arises that needs a special touch of the Lord, when something comes up that needs a special anointing, a special impact, a special ministry, don't fear, don't doubt. You are the man, you are the woman, and the Lord will use you. Just surrender your heart to the Lord, your spirit to the Lord, your life to the Lord. Bring your empty vessels, not a few. And let him fill you to overflowing. And not allow the power of God to leak out from you. With all the challenges of life. With all the day-to-day pressures that come upon you. Don't allow the spirit of God that divine unction to leak out. Preserve the precious gift. Preserve the rivers of water flowing out from you. Don't allow anything, anything to dam, to cut, to stop. The flowing of the rivers of water. The Holy Ghost in your life. Let it keep on flowing. Enriching your life. Empowering your life. Energizing you. Increasing your courage, your commitment, your consecration. Strengthening day after day that spirit of the conqueror that fears no Belshazzar, that trembles before no Nebuchadnezzar, declaring, Thus says the Lord. I don't mind. When those ignorant people who do not know you, neither know your Lord, your Redeemer, when they look down on you and belittle you and, and they despise you, are you of that Daniel, of the children of the captivity? Don't mind all that. That doesn't take anything away from you. That doesn't take anything away from the grace of God in your life. That doesn't take anything away from the revelation, the knowledge that heaven has about you. That's just their problem. That's not your problem. When they despise you. That's how they despise the Lord Jesus Christ. Because they didn't know him. And they don't know us. But thank God heaven knows you. Oh Daniel. Oh child of God. Greatly beloved. Rejoice in the knowledge. That heaven has concerning you. Don't be so dejected and depressed. Because they despise you. Look up. And see the smile. On the face of the heavenly father. Concerning you. And don't take the gifts, 
bribes, rewards of the people of the world. You have much more an enduring inheritance in heaven. You have the promise of the Lord. All who are forsaken houses or lands or brother or sister or father or mother, anything for my name's sake in this world, they will receive a hundredfold and in the world to come, life eternal. Great is your reward, both here and in heaven. Look away from their promises. All you need, you'll find in Christ. You go in the promise of the Lord, you'll supply all your need. Your needs will not be supplied by Belshazzar's and Nebuchadnezzar's and Herod's. Your help will come from the very throne of God.